Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm really, really happy uh, to be here and uh, to give the very first lecture of uh, this polyglot uh, gathering. It is always amazing to be in this wonderful community of uh, polyglots and to hear those languages around me and uh, to anticipate uh, speaking a lot of languages uh, with all of you over the next uh, few days and to learn a lot and to have a lot of fun. So uh, thank you all for getting up extra early to come to my lecture and I hope that I won't disappoint. So my topic is uh, fast track language learning. Uh, first of all, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Berlin, based in Berlin. Uh, I have a particular interest in non-European languages. I founded the Polyglot Gathering, but I don't um, organize it anymore. Whenever it's in Bratislava, it's organized by Lydia and her team. And uh, I work as a consultant for companies, for individuals, on computational linguistics, uh, language coding, this kind of thing. Uh, also, I am an author of language courses, and I'm proud to announce that by the time of the Polyglot conference, you will be able to buy language courses uh, that uh, Teach Yourself is, pub is publishing now for me. One is the uh, complete uh, Teach Yourself Complete Esperanto, and the other is uh, Script Hacking Arabic. And I'm actually publishing a series now uh, of uh, courses on how to learn a foreign script, uh, including uh, Arabic, uh, Greek, uh, Russian, Cyrillic, I mean, uh, uh, Devanagari for Hindi, and uh, uh, Hebrew, Korean, and a few others. And it will be a, a series. <laughs> So um, I think that's enough about me. Now, um, this fast track language learning, I want to start by saying what it's not. And it's not learn Japanese in seven days, learn Italian in 24 hours. Uh, I think we've all seen this kind of book and uh, it never keeps what it promises. Uh, especially those 24 hour ones, it usually just means that they have 24 lessons. Uh, which you're unlikely to complete in 24 hours until you're complete uh, nuts, like uh, my friend Luke over here. <laughs> so, um, um, this is not what I mean by fast track language learning, but I do mean a, an accelerated kind of learning. Um, so, why not? Why you should not use fast track language learning? Uh, because it is inefficient. If you're trying to cram something for an exam, uh, the weekend before you have this exam, uh, it is always going to be worse than having studied it uh, throughout the semester. So I do not recommend it, except if you have to, or if you have really good reasons uh, to try to uh, learn a language on the fast track. Uh, so for example, if you just met someone uh, and you're really anxious to be able to talk to him better, uh, if you found a new girlfriend or boyfriend, or if you're going to uh, a foreign country very soon and you know that you have to speak the language there, or you really want to speak the language there, uh, or maybe if you're being sent on a business trip, or if you're going to study abroad uh, at a foreign university, then you have a really good reason to want to learn the language fast, and then it makes sense to accept the inefficiency that comes with uh, trying to study it uh, faster rather than uh, in a ste steady place. The other thing is if, uh, like me, you know that uh, your uh, enthusiasm is going to wear off, your discipline is going to wear off, and uh, at some point uh, your attention is going to wander to other languages, uh, you're having trouble finding the time or deciding to, to study. So if you know that you're this kind of person where this happens uh, really, really quickly and you're not sure that you can keep up the study for months and months, uh, then maybe you want to uh, use this uh, fast track approach uh, or at least you want to start with the fast track approach and then afterwards uh, switch to the slow and steady study. Uh, and also, as a challenge to yourself, as a way to see uh, just how far you can go, I did this once uh, for fun. Uh, I always wanted to participate in an oratory competition. 
Uh, and then I saw that the in Indonesian embassy at, uh, in Berlin was organizing this oratory competition uh, and the pr only problem was that I knew zero Indonesian and the uh, competition was uh, six weeks from then. And I signed up for the competition and I actually gave a five minute speech. Uh, of course I prepared for nothing else during that time but um, it was just, you know, to see how far I could go, just for the fun of it. So, of course, I'm not saying that a language can be learned really completely uh, in a very, very short time. Because I think we've all seen this um, evidence from the Foreign Service Institute. They did a study, how long do you need to learn a, a certain language? For most European languages, it is around 600 hours. And if you can imagine 600 hours, you just cannot do that in one week. It's not technically possible. Uh, or if it's uh, Chinese, uh, it could be 2,000 hours. You're not going to do that uh, in a week or in a month. So what, what is really the difference is that in this case, uh, you're looking to pick out small parts of a language uh, which you can study in a short time. And you have to be really picky and you have to discard a lot of other things in order to get really good at this one thing uh, in a short amount of time. Uh, so generally something that can be learned in about 40 or 60 hours is what you're targeting at and this could be giving a speech. The thing is if you're participating in uh, a language course somewhere then it teaches you all kinds of things from tourist vocabulary to business vocabulary, uh, furniture, animals at the zoo, uh, it teaches you reading, writing, writing, speaking, listening, everything at once. If you decide that you're going to give a speech in Indonesian in six weeks, then you cannot afford to do all of that at once. You have to focus just on what you need to give a speech and just on the vocabulary that you need for the speech. Now, my speech was about learning languages, so I studied a lot of vocabulary like grammar, vocabulary, uh, goal setting, motivation, discipline, so many hours per week, and so on and so on. All these kind of expressions that you need in order to talk about languages. And I did not study many words for food or drinks, uh, or uh, how to buy uh, a leg one at a pet store, whatever. So that is really uh, the, the key of it, is that you pick out one of these items which could be giving a speech or it could be reading the news. It's a very worthwhile goal if you're interested in foreign affairs, international uh, diplomacy, then you might want to read the newspapers in a different country and you're getting a completely, completely different picture of uh, what is going on. I found this fascinating during the uh, Greek crisis, for example. Uh, to read all the Greek news, uh, news and to compare it to what was being published in Germany. Uh, one would think that uh, it was completely different uh, events going on. So uh, it is worthwhile. You could make this uh, your goal. Just spend uh, a few weeks, uh, f a couple months on learning to understand the news. And if you set that as your goal, then you need to focus really on the vocabulary you need for the news. Uh, the um, words for politician, for prime minister, for uh, court, for law, for... Uh, and, and also your, your method should reflect this. If you're going to read the news, then you will be having much uh, fewer conversations uh, during this time, and you're doing a lot more reading. Um, uh, but this kind of goal could also be uh, to get by in a foreign language, to, to have an easy conversation. Uh, and that is what I see a lot of uh, ha language hackers do, is to uh, set like a three months uh, goal or 90 days uh, add one challenge uh, to have a conversation, to have decent conversations with friends, not the kind of... Uh, ready to give an interview to a newspaper kind of conversation, uh, but just to be able to talk. Uh, and that could also be one of these goals for which you also need approximately this, uh, in my experience, uh, 40 to 60 hours, uh, maybe twice, if, depending on the level of conversation you want to have. And if you look at that, uh, if that's going to be your, your goal, 40 hours could be uh, seven hours a week, or if you do a spread if for, for six weeks, or if you spread it over three months, it could be uh, uh, three and a half hours a week, like half an hour a day. 
and that is doable. If you're going to go for the high, higher end uh, proficiency, maybe uh, five, uh, five hours a week for three months, I think it's something that uh, we can commit to. It's not too long, it doesn't uh, uh, interfere with uh, your, your life. It doesn't uh, require you to commit to uh, five years until you're fluent in Japanese. Uh, it can be daunting. This is a way to, to give the language a try. I'm not saying to stop after that time, but uh, to just set yourself a, a quick goal in order to have the motivation to continue, in order to have something that you can do in the language which uh, gives you pleasure. Uh, I did it for Japanese ones. I wanted to understand Japanese anime, a particular series that I was uh, fond of, and I wanted to watch it in the original uh, without subtitles. Uh, and I just studied a lot of, you know, I did a lot of listening comprehension, listening practice of Japanese, specifically with that series, specifically with that kind of vocabulary. Uh, and it is possible to achieve that, uh, because we, you, are, you are skipping all the other items uh, that you also see, like uh, a lot of vocabulary that you're just skipping, a lot of grammar that you're skipping, a lot of uh, essay writing that you're skipping at a higher level, um, or even reading the news. If your goal is to understand this particular anime series, you would not simultaneously try to train yourself to understand Japanese news. And that is the problem with uh, most regular language courses and uh, regular language co uh, schools is that they try to teach you everything for everyone. And that is why you're making uh, very slow progress on any particular goal. But if you have a particular goal, you can make faster progress towards that. Uh, so the p point is that you need to be focused on the skill that you need and the vocabulary that you need. And one way to achieve that is to choose the right materials. So you might look at Teach Yourself Spanish versus Michelle Thomas, uh, which has uh, business Spanish, Spanish by reading and video audio based courses. And the main reason you should, should choose one or the other is uh, how it uh, how it compares to your goal. So if your goal is to go to Spain and to have uh, uh, I don't, business uh, conversations and negotiations uh, there, then you should be looking at a business uh, Spanish course. Uh, but even with the, if you're looking at the normal beginner kind of courses, you can read the dialogues and uh, see what kind of person they have in mind. Some of the beginner courses have dialogues about tourist situations. So you know they're directed at tourists. Some of the beginner courses have dialogues about uh, a person uh, enrolling at a language school. Some of them have dialogues about uh, talking to friends. Um, language Hacking Spanish by Ben and Lewis has a focus on internet conversations. So he's assuming that your first conversations in Spanish are going to be with uh, someone on Skype. And you're learning things like, my connection is not very good, uh, you're breaking up, um, <laughs> things like that. Yes, and that's what you need. You, you, if you're going to make fast progress, you should look for a course that has the kind of expressions that you need. Uh, and uh, if you wind up with a course that is less than optimal, especially in a smaller language where there's not so much choice, uh, then you need to do a lot of discarding. You look at the vocabulary list and you literally strike out half the items because you don't see yourself using them for the next few months. Uh, whenever you see a word that you're not going to use in the next uh, few months, uh, you should refuse to learn it. You can come back to it later, maybe put it uh, as a card far, far in the back of your uh, flashcard set, but uh, do not spend the time on it if you're planning to be fast. Because there is no way around those 600 hours that you need for a complete fluency. So if you're going to study something fast, you need to cut down you cannot uh, expect to have the same content as uh, someone who studies those 600 hours. Uh, then there's uh, the idea of using different tools for different goals. So when I was studying for this uh, Japanese anime, uh, I used uh, subs to SRS, which is a really awesome tool. I'm not sure if you know it, it converts subtitles uh, to flashcards. So you give it a video file, you give it uh, subtitles in Japanese, you give it subtitles in English, uh, and then it 
uh, automatically takes audio out of the videos and it creates these little audio chunks of uh, sentences or half sentences along with the Japanese and the English translation and a little picture of that moment in the um, movie or in the TV series uh, and you can use that as flashcards. It's an amazing tool and it's really good if you're going to try to understand a TV series or a movie as your goal because you can practice directly with the TV series that you want to understand and your vocabulary will be 100% <laughs> 100% perfect for the task that you set yourself. Um, if your goal is uh, reading something, like reading the news, I can really, un uh, really recommend Transover. Uh, Transover is a tool for your browser, uh, a plugin. If you click on any word, you see the translation. So if you have a news article and at the beginning of your month or two months you have I don't know, 50% of words you don't understand, you can just click on each of them in a row and it goes really fast and you can read that way because you don't have to copy-paste, you don't have to mark the words, you don't have to look them up in a dictionary, you just click, you see the translation, click, 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 click. You can read a whole text like that. Uh, and it's a way to get familiar with the language and to enjoy texts that are way be beyond their level. Uh, if your goal is writing, I imagine you want to use uh, Lang8 a lot, which is a site where you can uh, put your text and get uh, corrections by native speakers. Uh, and if your goal is speaking, you want to, be, you, uh, you want to take a lot of uh, online lessons or generally lessons with a tutor who can help you with your speaking. So it also depends on which ability you're focusing on and you need to choose uh, the right methods in order to get uh, the practice that you need for this level. And always adjust further, always make sure that uh, what the material you're using uh, is not just uh, the best out of a few, but that you also customize it uh, and that you look up uh, additional words that you need, that you uh, look up especially chunks that you need. One chunk for me is a freelance computational linguist. Now this chunk is totally useless for the vast majority of people, but for me it is essential because that's what I am, I'm a freelance computational linguist. So it's one of the first things I learned to say in uh, a lot of languages. This is what uh, Benny calls uh, me language, and you're going to use it all the time. Or uh, Boris Schechtman calls it uh, islands, uh, things that you can talk about um, even a, a series of, of sentences, one paragraph, two paragraphs worth of language uh, of things that you will always talk about. For example, how did you learn our language? Why are you learning our language? These questions always, always, always come up when you start to talk to someone in, in their native language, uh, especially a more uh, uh, exotic language. They will ask you that. So you know you can prepare in advance and if you're prepared that gives you uh, a bit of um, a break from the uh, difficulty of speaking the language and we have something prepared that you can just say and after that you continue with a difficult uh, conversation. Um, that is the idea of the islands and I, I cannot really ex uh, explain it so fast so I recommend you also look it up in uh, Boris Schechtman's uh, awesome book um, How to Improve Your Foreign Language uh, Immediately. Um, okay. So this is a sample day. Uh, if you're going to do a hardcore study, now I find it really difficult to do more than two or three hours of study a day, but it also depends on managing your energy levels. Uh, for one language it is fairly difficult, especially as a beginner. Uh, you may not have enough mental energy to be studying a textbook all day. Uh, or even to get back to it, half an hour now, half an hour later, half an hour at, in the evening. Uh, if you can do it, great, it will help you. If you can do Anki for an hour a day, great. Uh, but you also should think of things that you can do that do not require so much energy. So, for example, watching a movie. Uh, even with subtitles, it can help you. Uh, studying a song, just going on YouTube, browsing whatever the trends are for that particular country. Uh, browsing the internet, uh, reading some news, re reading some emails uh, in a foreign language, uh, some light reading. Uh, those are things that can also count towards your language time and in the end, uh, if you're going to need 600 hours, you might as well uh, study any way you can 
to try to get those hours faster. So this is an idea of how you could fit in more language time even if you currently uh, have a job, if you have a work day. You could study uh, on the way to work, for example. Uh, you could have a language lunch. Now, I'm really proud of this invention. When I was working at an international company, uh, I created these uh, company lunches where all the French speakers would get together, or all the Italians would get together, uh, or all the sp uh, Spanish people would get together, and having lunch together once a week. Uh, and of course, for the Italians in the company, it was just a way to, to connect up and to speak a bit of the old language. But for me, it was great language practice. <laughs> Uh, and it was fun, and we learned a lot about uh, how different parts of the company work. So it was useful as well. Uh, now, if you're not a hardcore kind of person, then you should just aim to find a consistent half an hour a day. Um, in my diagram earlier, I said that if you're studying half an hour a day for three months, then you can aim to complete one of these challenges, like to be able to deliver a speech, or to be able to have basic conversations, uh, or to be able to understand the news. One of these, not all of them. Uh, so you'd pick one of these goals, you give it uh, three months and half an hour a day, you should be fine. If you can give it more time, you may be able to go faster or to do better. There's always room for improvement. Uh, and if you are on this kind of uh, setting, and you don't have a fixed time when you can study languages. What I found helps really well is to... Okay. I'm not sure why it's... Hmm? Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, so one thing that I found helps, uh, helps a lot if you're on this kind of weird schedule and you never know, especially if you're traveling, is if you set a timer one hour before your bedtime. So maybe if you're going to bed at midnight, always set a timer for uh, 11 p.m. And if by 11 p.m. you haven't studied half an hour of language yet, then you should do something right then when the timer goes off. Now, this is not the ideal time to be studying a language, so I would propose to do something really easy. For example, to copy the, the words from your latest uh, um, Skype uh, tutoring session uh, into Anki. Just to copy the vocabulary, uh, or to copy some text into your notebook, uh, or to listen to some songs on YouTube, maybe sing along. Easy things. Uh, but the important thing is to keep going and uh, to do something every day. Uh, and this is also to match your energy level. Uh, there is uh, low and high mental energy and there is low and high physical en energy. Now this low mental energy is what I said before. You could uh, do something um, that you can do even if you're not really focused, like to copy. Uh, to copy language into Anki, to copy the stuff into your exercise book. Uh, high mental energy is what you need to study uh, vocabulary, like to study Anki, not to copy stuff into uh, Anki, but to study it, uh, or to study a textbook. If you have high mental energy, you can do something like that. That's a great state to be in. Uh, then there's physical energy, which you can also watch. Uh, so f high physical energy, you know, sometimes you just want to lie in bed, you just want to sit on the couch, you just don't want to move, don't move me. Uh, this kind of attitude, you can use that. You can use your own laziness against you if you sit on the couch uh, and you have something on your smartphone, for example Anki, for example some other language learning app, just sit on the couch and study with that app. And because you don't want to move, you also don't want to stop studying that app, because move, <laughs> to do anything else you would have to move. Uh, so, uh, the same if you have high physical energy, this is something that uh, Professor Aguelles does a lot. Uh, he likes to get out in the morning and uh, to, to jog or to walk a lot while shadowing language. So he has like Asimil on, uh, on his earbuds and uh, he walks and uh, speaks along. Uh, shadows uh, the, the Asimil courses and sometimes you know you cannot bring yourself to study a textbook because you are um, you're jittery you, you, you want to move you, ca you cannot force yourself to sit still and if that's the case why don't you go to the nearest gym or why do you, don't you go outside uh, take your podcast along with you and uh, study that way uh, 
So you need to uh, be aware of how much mental energy you have and how much physical energy you currently have or how much jitteriness you have and then you can find activities that match that. Uh, and uh, yeah, also it helps to enroll in one of the polyglot challenges like the add one challenge uh, or the um, six week challenge uh, which is free, uh, the Tadoku challenge. The Tadoku challenge is about reading as much as possible. It was originally for Westerners studying Japanese and you know it's kind of difficult when you're studying an Asian language to force yourself to read a lot because it's so damn slow at the beginning. So uh, if you have that kind of problem you can enroll in the Tadoku challenge and just start reading along with the others and count your, your pages and have a high score of who's reading how much and just draw strength from that community. So that is uh, the essence of what I wanted to uh, talk to about talk about today. The key is to keep your goal in mind, not to do just, just anything. If if you have this uh, if you have this uh, fast track challenge, then you need to keep the goal in mind. Otherwise, just do whatever feels good. Uh, so. Uh, keep the goal in mind and do exactly the steps that uh, will lead to it and refuse to do things, to refuse to get sidetracked. Uh, the ability to achieve this depends on not doing things that uh, sound good but don't really help right now. So the, uh, you have to tell yourself afterwards, after those uh, three months, after the six weeks, you can still uh, invo get involved in the other abilities uh, that you're skipping for now. You can still learn those words that you're currently skipping. That is the key. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have uh, 15 minutes for questions. Okay. Uh, so the first question, uh, also I'm sorry, we're, but we're experiencing some technical issues with the presentation, so hopefully it gets resolved later. Uh, so the first question is, how do you find appropriate material for such a specialized part of the language? Well, you cannot always find the material. Sometimes you have to create it yourself, um, especially for the smaller languages, uh, like for the Indonesian speaking challenge. I knew I was going to give a speech about how to learn languages. And of course, there's no regular beginner textbook that talks about how to learn languages and uh, tells you how you can describe your lear learning routine. Uh, so what I did was uh, I kind of wrote the speech uh, in uh, as little Indonesian as I knew and uh, in English uh, and I had a native speaker translate it into good Indonesian uh, and then I studied that speech. It was like uh, two pages and I studied that speech not as a way to learn it by heart but just to learn the vocabulary that is in that speech and the uh, chunks especially because you have to learn a lot of chunks if you want to be speaking uh, anytime soon. Uh, actually that's maybe something worth uh, stating because it's not so known I'm not, I'm not touching any of them. Yeah, so um, you know that our brain is physically unable to recall the words and grammar fast enough to actually have a conversation. So if you know 5,000 words, it will not make you any more fluent. What you actually need is chunks. Uh, you need to have things ready in your mind which are which go beyond the word level. Uh, for example, ein Bier bitte, uh, or uh, ich möchte, uh, not mögen, which you then transform into the conjunctive möchte and then ich möchte. No, you have to have it ready. Ich möchte, one chunk. Uh, ein Bier bitte, one chunk. Uh, freelance computational linguist, one chunk. <laughs> yes, if you have to look in your brain, what the hell is the word for freelance? What is computational linguistics? No, you cannot have a conversation at that level. You need these chunks in order to be able to speak. Uh, and that is especially important if you're having this short-term challenge. Uh, if you set yourself a speaking uh, goal or, or ability to have conversations, uh, you need to focus a lot more on finding these uh, fixed expressions uh, that can help you st uh, speak the language faster. One of the courses which is really good for that is uh, the Michel Thomas 
because at Michel Thomas courses they, they find these shortcuts, they find these uh, set expressions which may be beyond your level but which help you uh, have a conversation sooner. You can use my Thank you. Uh, the next, next question is, how do you feel about very inaccurate subs? I run into this problem with Russian all the time. Well, it's, it's great, isn't it? If you notice that they're inaccurate, that means that your language level is already better than the person who wrote them. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it's something that you cannot avoid. I mean, sometimes you have a choice of uh, subs, but usually there's just one. And then when you notice that something is inaccurate, you just have to retranslate, maybe with the help of a friend, maybe with the help of uh, machine translation. You, can, you cannot uh, do anything about it, but the key is they can still be used to uh, help you practice the language. As long as it's, um, well, there's, obviously there's a problem if the subs are inaccurate in your target language. Now then I don't recommend them. Um, but the idea is, when you're using the subs to S, uh, S is that you have uh, the, um, the subtitles in the same language as the sound that you're hearing. So, in my case, studying the Japanese anime, I wasn't even reading the Japanese so much. They might have been inaccurate, I wouldn't know, because I was listening. Uh, I was listening to the uh, series and trying to understand. That was the whole um, the, the practice that I did every day uh, for half an hour or more. Uh, just. Uh, using these flashcards cards which had me listening to a chunk of Japanese and trying to understand it uh, out of context. Yeah? Use this one. Okay. No, it's fine. Uh, the next question is... Okay, if you if you could please repeat those useful apps again, it was because it was cut off the screen. Uh, Transover is uh, what I recommend for your browser if you're going to read foreign news or anything that can be called up into a browser. Uh, you can click on any word to see the translation. Uh, Subs to SOS is the app for subtitles, turning them into flashcards or actually turning entire movies and TV series into flashcards. It works even better with uh, TV series uh, than with movies because in a TV series uh, you have a lot of repetitive language. Just like reading a novel is easier than reading a poem or even a short story because the author has a limited vocabulary and if you keep reading more by the same author then you are going to uh, not need so many different uh, dis distinct words. Uh, and uh, Lang8 uh, for writing texts and getting corrections. It's Lang8. Lang. L-A-N-G, like language. They stopped? Wow, I didn't know that. I still use them. Okay, I just hear that italki also has this feature. Yeah. Okay, we have time for some more questions. So, how much time per day do you dedicate towards maintaining one of your stronger languages? It uh, depends on whether I am in one of these uh, challenges or not. If, it, if I am, it might be just half an hour or one hour. Uh, if uh, not, then basically all my language study time will be dedicated to maintenance. So, I actually have this philosophy of uh, choosing one uh, weak language or beginner language and one advanced language uh, at all times uh, because it goes well with the idea of uh, different energy levels. So if I study a language new, for example creation right now, then most of the activities open to me are activities that require a lot of mental energy like studying flashcards or studying the textbook. Uh, so, I, of course, I could also be listening to, to songs, but I, I don't have as many options as I do for an advanced language like Chinese. For Chinese, I could do anything. Of course, I could do flashcards or textbook. I rarely do. Uh, 
are much more likely to listen to the radio or watch a TV series or read a book, uh, something like that, or even prepare a presentation for class. So um, I have more of these low, uh, low mental energy activities open to me. So if I have one uh, language uh, at the beginner level, like Croatian, which is mostly these high energy activities, and one uh, advanced language, uh, like Chinese or French, or one of the languages that I already speak quite well, then uh, I have a lot of uh, low mental energy activities that I can do, like well, just watching another episode of a TV series. Sometimes I binge on those Chinese TV series, and uh, it's just something that you can sit and you don't need particularly much energy to do. So this is really the optimal setup, at least for me, uh, is to, to have two languages that I key, that I really work on, and then uh, whatever languages come into my day uh, in addition to that. So I have friends writing to me in Dutch or in, in French. Uh, I have uh, work that sometimes requires me to answer to emails in Italian, in Spanish, in Greek. Um, whatever comes up, uh, I use those languages and I have these two focus languages. One beginner language, not more beginner languages because it slows me down too much. If I try to learn Croatian from the start and uh, I don't know, Japanese from the start, then uh, I have I have to split the times when I have high energy. I have to split these times between studying Croatian textbook and studying a Japanese textbook. Studying Croatian flashcards and studying Japanese flashcards. For me, that's less efficient. If I, if I have this kind of energy, I want to just make progress on one language for about three months, sometimes six months, and then I switch languages around, and I choose a different beginner language, and I choose a different advanced language to focus on. How do you find the time to keep up other languages while learning a new one? Basically just this. Um, I mean, I am not that good. I do lose some languages that I don't study anymore or don't, I didn't manage to integrate into my day. For example, I did a 90-day challenge uh, for uh, Vietnamese. Uh, you can see it on my YouTube channel. Uh, also the Indonesian speech is on my YouTube channel if you want. Uh, so. I did not do any, ja any Vietnamese uh, after my challenge. I told myself that I would just go into the Vietnamese restaurants in Berlin and start speaking Jap uh, Vietnamese with the people there, and it didn't actually happen, and I didn't make any Vietnamese-speaking friends, so that is a language that I don't actually keep up. But uh, otherwise, you have to find, uh, sooner or later, you have to find a way to, to integrate the language into your day, and it's probably by way of the things that you set up to do in the first place. So. If you learned Japanese because of this anime series, then uh, yeah, you can keep watching that series and your Japanese will never leave you. Uh, if you learned Hebrew in order to talk to some friends and you keep being friends with them, then your Hebrew will never leave you. If you find people who will write you emails in a few languages, then uh, you cannot really get around using those languages because those emails arrive and you have to read them, obviously, and you have to reply to them. <laughs> so. Um, this is the best way of keeping languages active, is just to ensure that you have no way around using them. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Also, there are some questions regarding if uh, this presentation is, is going to be somewhere online, uploaded maybe? Uh, I don't know option. about the recordings. I imagine that they will be uploaded sooner recordings, or later. Recordings, yes, but I mean uh, slides from the presentation. Uh, I can send the slides to whoever wants them. Just uh, send me an email. So you can see my email address at the bottom, judith at learnlangs.com. Uh, can you, maybe maybe if you can write it, um, it would be better, actually. But on the second line, it, it was there. Was it? Here. Oh, okay. Okay, you did at learnlangs.com. Just send me a message and I will send you the slides. And so the last questions would be... I tried chunking with Icelandic, Icelandic. Uh, but have found it very hard to retain chunks. I literally have to listen dozens of times to remember anything. What to do? 
maybe listening is not your first activity, at least for me it isn't. I'm not a very auditory learner. So what works best for me is to uh, have uh, written as well as uh, audio material. For example, for Anki, whenever possible, uh, I ask uh, a teacher to record the cards for me. So I create the cards based on my tutoring lessons so that they are 100% uh, fit uh, for me. Um, based on whatever vocabulary I needed to express myself. That is also important, to have this feeling that you need the vocabulary. I just didn't have this feeling. I tried to learn some Native American languages and the vocabulary was about deers and hunting and I don't know. I, I couldn't learn them because I didn't see the relevance for me. But uh, when I have a, a lesson with a tutor, then uh, I know I will talk about language learning, about the polyglot gathering, about my work, about anything that's uh, passionate for me. Uh, uh, that, that I'm passionate about, I mean, and uh, I will wind up with this uh, vocabulary list because I would ask my, my tutors to, to write all words that I don't know at, at that moment and to write them in the text uh, chat. Then afterwards I create Anki cards based on them. Uh, and then uh, when I have a few hundred, uh, I ask a teacher to record uh, those cards. Uh, just to say, to, to pronounce whatever is written on them. And then I found these uh, cards really, really efficient to have the listening and the speaking. And all of, uh, when I um, write a card, I always try to make it a chunk, uh, which does not mean three random words that are stuck together. Uh, if I have uh, the word uh, swallow, I don't put the white swallow, but uh, uh, I try to find words that uh, I would use together most that I would most like to use uh, together. So, um, like to order a drink, I would not memorize uh, Ich möchte ein Bier bitte, because I don't drink beer. So for me, I'm most likely to say uh, Ich möchte, uh, I don't know, eine Cola bitte, uh, or ein Wasser bitte. So I, uh, I choose chunks that relate to how I would use those phrases. And that is why I can remember them. Mm, okay, we, ha we unfortunately don't have time for more questions. So thank you everyone very much. Thank you. Thank you.